I hope that you can hang with me tonight and follow along with me in Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 is where we'll be studying from this evening. I think it's one of the, <clears throat> one of the best known stories in the Old Testament, the story of the Israelites conquering uh, the city of Jericho by the nation of Israel under the leadership of Joshua. It's a familiar story to us, and I'm glad we're going to study it tonight. Um, I, I believe it's of great value to look at a story like this. Oftentimes, we, we think of a story like this just for our, our young children. It's a great Bible class story for them to learn and, and to march uh, and a great activity for them. But it's a great lesson for us as well tonight as we look through this great story. You know, I was reminded back uh, a few years ago, I read an article about how some of the publishing companies were wanting to get rid of the songs in hymnals that had anything to do with any military theme or the idea of, of battles and war and God wiping out His foes and defeating His enemies. And I think that's a very unfortunate move because I think that you can argue when you think about the theme of Scripture. The theme of Scripture is God's holy warfare against Satan and against sin. And I believe that back in Genesis chapter 3, in the garden, when God made that great promise that from the seed of woman, a, a redeemer would come, that God has been fighting and declaring war on Satan. And I don't read anywhere in Scripture where God has declared a truce with Satan. Neither do I read in my Bible that God recognizes neutrality, that we could just kind of hang in the middle. You see, there is a cosmic war that is going on between good and evil, between light and darkness, between God and Satan, and you are on one side of the battle or the other. There are no neutral armies. And I believe the importance of this study tonight that instructs us on how to view this war, kind of how to view this, this cosmic conflict that we're all engaged in. Because when we look at this story in Joshua chapter 6, it's a call for us as Christians, as God's people, to renew our commitment to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, to be in the army of the Lord. So if you look in Joshua chapter 6, uh, in the first five verses, God gives instructions for the siege of Jericho, these specific instructions. And our, our young, young people tonight could tell us that the Israelites were to march around the city once a day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they were to march seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets of ram's horns. And then you begin reading in chapter, or in verse 6 through verse 14, where Joshua commands the people to proceed as God instructed. And so for six days, the Israelites, they march around Jericho. And the Ark of the Covenant, as we talked about yesterday, is leading the way, and the priests are blowing the trumpet. So let's pick up now in verse 15 in this story. It says, on the seventh day they rose early at the dawn of day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priest had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall live, because she hid the messengers whom she sent. But you, keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all silver and gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. Verse 20 says, so the people shouted and the trumpets were blown. As soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout and the walls fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him and they captured the city. Then they devoted all in the city to destruction, both men and women, young and old, oxen, sheep, and donkeys with the edge of the sword. So I want you to think about what we read here in Joshua chapter 6 and a couple of things to appreciate here. I want you to try to appreciate 
What is going on in the mind of Joshua as he contemplated conquering Jericho? And as Jericho had to be conquered, because from a military standpoint, Israel would want to conquer the central territory first. Then they would want to go to the south. And then finally, they would want to go up to the northern territory. But before they did that, they had to conquer Jericho. You have to get Jericho. And Joshua has never fought a battle against a fortified city. Now, he's won a couple of battles before out in the Transjordan area, out in the plains. And so, the Israelites, they knew how to fight. But no, understand, they didn't have battering rams. They didn't have ladders. They didn't have catapults. They didn't have what you would need in order to lay siege to a walled, mighty city. And maybe that's why when you look back in chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, it says in verse 13 that Joshua lifted up his eyes and he looked. And so Joshua was out contemplating how he was going to take Jericho, how all of this was going to take place. And it's here that night when he looks up, he sees a man standing before him with his drawn sword and sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and he said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? adversaries. And he said, no, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to this servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. I love this encounter that Joshua has with the man with the drawn sword. And he asks the question, are you for us or against us? Are you, are you with us or are you, are you with our enemies? And he said, neither. I am the commander of the army of the Lord. And he said, you're standing on holy ground. And I think that commander that night came to remind Joshua of something very important. Something for him to understand that Joshua was the servant of the Lord. While Joshua may have been the leader of Israel, he was in charge of the conflict. He was still a servant of the Lord, and God was going to fight the battle of Jericho. I know the old song, Joshua fought the battle at Jericho, but the reality is God fought the battle at Jericho. And I think really maybe the main point of Joshua chapter 6 is that God fights for His people. We have to grasp this. I want to show you something in verse 2 that I think is one of the most interesting statements that we read in this chapter. If you look at verse 2 of chapter 6, it says, And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. I want you to think for just a moment, ask you something here. If you were standing there when the Lord said, I have delivered Jericho, or I have given Jericho into your hands, what would you have seen? What would your eyes have seen? Because I think in that moment, the only thing that you could see with the physical eye was a huge city with 13 foot high, six foot thick walls all the way around it. So all you could see with the physical eye were giant walls. The eyes of flesh see a wall, but the eyes of faith see the will of God. The eyes of faith see the victorious and conquerable will, or I should say unconquerable will of God. And that's what I want you to hear first this evening as we get into this story, is that God demands we see the battle through the eyes of faith. As I mentioned in the beginning, we are all in a spiritual battle. We all face the enemy every day of our lives. And even as we find ourselves up against our own Jericho, sometimes we find ourselves up against our own wall. And I don't know what that wall is. It's, it's similar to the Jordan that we talked about yesterday. But if you just picture this giant wall ahead of you, 
some struggle that you have in your life. Maybe it's addictions that you've had trouble facing and in dealing with or struggles with family and children and in relationships. Or maybe it's the wall of a, of a loved one who, who isn't seeking the Lord. Can you see God delivering Jericho into your hands? I'm reminded of the African Impala. Maybe you've seen uh, the Impala at, at, at the zoo if you've ever visited. The Impala can jump over 10 feet high and cover a distance when it jumps of over 30 feet. Yet, when you go to the zoo and you see these magnificent creatures, they're kept in this enclosure. Most of the time, the only way they're kept in this enclosure is through just a three-foot wall. You say, whoa. It can jump higher than that. Why doesn't it just jump? Well, because the impala will not jump if it cannot see where its feet will land. And I think a lot of us as Christians can be like that. That Satan puts up walls before us and they seem so huge. They seem to be such incredible walls. That's what Satan wants us to think. But they're really not. These are walls that can come down, but we don't see how it's going to come down. We don't see how there's going to be victory. All we see is that we're, we're just hemmed in, we're just trapped, and there's no way that the wall is going to come down. I want to remind you in Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 30 in the great hall of faith, that says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Why did Israel gain victory? Why were they able to capture the city? It's because Israel could see by the eye of faith. They could see by the eye of faith what their enemies could not see. So let me just share with you this evening three things, three things that faith understands about walls. And the first one is this, and we touched on this a little bit yesterday morning. But faith understands or faith sees that victory has already been decided. This is such an important point for us to grasp. <clears throat> and I'll illustrate it this way. I'm reminded by the story from the Korean War. It illustrates this kind of attitude. Uh, the, as the enemy forces advanced, there was the Baker Company. That, they were known as the Baker Company. And they were cut off from the rest of their unit. They were by themselves. And for several hours, no one had heard from them. There had been no radio contact between them and headquarters, even though headquarters had tried to communicate with the troops. And finally, there was this faint signal that was received, and, and they, they, they struggled to hear a, the words of the course men. And they asked, they said, Baker Company, do you read me? And the reply came, this is Baker Company. And the headquarters said, what's your situation? And Baker Company came back and said, well, the enemy is to the east of us. The enemy is to the west of us. The enemy is to the north of us. The enemy is to the south of us. And then there was a brief pause, and the sergeant from the Baker Company said with great determination, the enemy is not going to get away from us now. Although they were surrounded, although they were outnumbered, notice the attitude. The attitude was, is that they were fighting from victory. They were not considering defeat. And I think that's a great illustration of, of Israel in this situation. I mean, think about how they are surrounded. They've got a, a, a flooding Jordan River to their backs, and to their right, and to their left, and to the front. They are surrounded by enemy forces. But the thoughts of the army, army was on victory, because God said to Joshua, see, I have given Jericho into your hands. You notice how God says that. God says it as if it's already accomplished. And what we call that in Scripture is uh, prophetic perfect. And just simply what that means is, is you're talking about a future action as if it's already accomplished. It's already taken place. And so in other words, God is saying, Joshua, the victory has been decided before the battle has started. And so when they march around the city, when they march around that city for seven days, they are marching in triumph already. 
even though the walls haven't come down yet, they are already marching in triumph. There's a victory parade that had to take place before the walls come down. And I think about how that's a march that their forefathers, they could have made if they could have seen the battle through the eyes of faith. Let me share with you something the Hebrews writer said in Hebrews chapter 3. Take your Bible to Hebrews chapter 3, and I want to show you this starting in verse 19. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning at verse 19. Hebrews 3 at verse 19 says, so we see that they were unable to enter, they were unable to enter the promised land. Why? Because of unbelief. In other words, because they looked at things through the physical eye. They saw giants. They didn't think they could take the land. So verse four, or verse one of chapter four says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as, it, as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Or I love the way the New International Version puts that in verse 1. But the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard it did not combine it with faith. And that's supposed to be verse 2. But you notice that they heard it, but they didn't combine it with faith. And so I want to ask you this question this evening to all of us. Are we combining the promises of God with faith? Because when we think about the promises of God, the promises of God are sure and they are clear that Satan cannot put up walls to stop victorious progress of God's people. Let's grasp this tonight, that he cannot put up a wall that can stand against the people of God. And so are we stepping out in faith on those promises? Or are we going to be like the older generation? Are we going to be like that generation that just stays back in the wilderness and just can't see how in the world God is going to make this happen? You know, I want to share with you tonight that if you are following Christ, if you are a child of God and you are trusting and following and obeying Him, your victory is certain. It is not in doubt. You don't have to wonder whether or not you are going to be victorious. Notice the words of Jesus in John 12 in verse 31. Now this is the judgment of the world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. Well, Jesus sure doesn't sound like he's he's unsure about what's going to happen. He doesn't sound like this is kind of up for debate and we'll we'll see what happens and, and who comes out victorious. He sounds like the commander of the Lord's army talking to Joshua. He says, I'm, I tell you what's going to happen. The ruler of this world is going to be cast out. It is sure. It is decided. Can you see it? Notice in Colossians chapter 2 in verse 13, you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Notice this next verse in verse 13. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. I mean, do you notice the words of victory there? This is certain. Jesus has won. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that victory has been decided. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, the question is going to be, are we going to accept these powerful promises in God's Word with faith? Or are we going to be like the fathers of the children of Israel and not enter into our rest because we will not combine them with faith. You know, as Christians, we do not have to live a weak, frail, feeble life where Satan can just put up walls and keep us from blessings in Christ and keep us down and and feel like all we do is lose. Satan wants us to think that we are 
are far from victorious as a Christian. But do you believe the clear, delivered word of God that that's what you are, that you are victorious? You see, you've got to decide if you can see the wall coming down because of what God said, because of God's promise. Now, remember, Satan is going to tell you it's up there forever. It's too high. It's too thick. It's too wide. However you want to say it, it's up there forever. But you need to remind Satan that your commander has defeated him. He has won the victory and that your life in Jesus Christ is going to be one delivered victory after another. In fact, the next time Satan whispers in our ear and says, that wall's never coming down, I want us all to point to the empty tomb and say, that's a lie. I know that's a lie because Jesus came out of the grave. And when you do that, you remind him and you remind yourself I'm on the right side. Satan is defeated. You see, we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. God wins. The Lord has already decided the outcome. He's given us victory. It's just by faith we have to see it and accept it and walk in it. Well, the second thing that faith sees, faith sees the delight God takes in defeating his enemies with foolishness. I want you to think about it. What military advisor would say, now, now here's how you're going to take, here's how you're going to take Jericho. I, I know you see this fortified city. Here's how you're going to take Jericho. Don't worry about catapults. Don't worry about battering rams. Don't worry about flaming arrows. Here's what you need. I want you to go get yourself some good trumpets. Make sure they're good trumpets and march around a few times and uh, as my grandma would say, holler a few times. Just holler and, you, and you'll win. What military advisor would say that? And in the meantime, they're shooting arrows at you. They're laughing at you. They're, they're ridiculing you. They're mocking you for just blowing trumpets and shouting. And your army's going to be confused. But that's the strategy. That's how you're going to conquer. That makes absolutely no sense. But of course it doesn't. That's how God operates. This is what God does. God purposefully breaks with the logic of men so that we don't depend upon our own strength. And let me just share with you a few reasons why I think God said, forget about the arrows, forget about the battering arms, and just march around the city. I think number one, it is to impress upon Israel the reality of their own weakness. They got a good look at those walls. They got seven days to stare at those walls and realize that we cannot knock them down by our own strength. Now, another reason why I think so is it gives Jericho the opportunity to repent. I'm convinced of this, that God was giving Jericho seven days to repent. And if there was one person in that city like Rahab, it pains me that I had to skip over chapter two, but one person like Rahab that would have turned to God, to the God of Israel, they would have been spared that judgment that was coming. God wanted, to, wanted them to repent. But I think the main thing God was trying to do was to test the willingness of Israel to trust God's way over their own. You know, we don't want to obey orders unless they make absolute sense to us. I mean, if, if you're a parent here tonight, our children think that way. When we give them something to do and we tell them to do something, what do they want? Well, why do I have to do that? They want an explanation. And I think the hardest thing for a young person to hear is because I said so. That's why. And it's hard for them to hear and it's hard for us as adults to hear that too because we want an explanation. If I'm going to do something, I want to know the reason why. I want to know what's the benefit. What, what am I going to get out of this? But let me tell you something. If God's way always makes sense to us, then we don't need faith to obey it. If it makes sense, what's the purpose of faith? You see, I want you to realize 
this evening that one of the reasons God wants us to be obedient to his foolish ways is that when we are obedient to God's foolish ways, we can't take any of the credit. We don't get any of the glory. When we do things by God's way, by his commands, he gets all the glory. It's his name that is glorified. You see, if God had said, you go knock down those walls with 500 bat battering rams, the God of Israel wouldn't have received any glory. And the rest of Canaan would have been just thinking Israel did that by their own strength. But when they marched around, they blew the trumpets and they shouted all over Canaan, the God of Israel, the true living God, received all the glory. We see this throughout Scripture. It's like when Gideon, when God said to Gideon, uh, you don't need 32,000 men. I just want you to take 300 men, give each one of them a jar and a torch and a horn and blow it and I'll give you victory. Again, how ridiculous does that sound? How foolish is that to our way of thinking? But after the Midianites were routed, who got the glory? Was it Gideon or was it God? When Naaman came to Elisha, and Elisha says, if you'll go dip seven times in the Jordan River, you'll be cured of your leprosy. And you remember that Naaman didn't like that. He didn't want to do that. He would just rather buy his healing. But when he finally submitted and he went and dipped himself in the Jordan River, he was cleansed. When he did that, who got the glory? Was it Naaman or was it God? You see, God delights in defeating his enemies through foolishness. Let me share with you a passage in 1 Corinthians. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because in God's ways of foolishness is when he gets all the glory. And there's nothing that seems more foolish to the armies of hell, or for that matter, more foolish to the unbelieving secular mind today than a cross outside the city of Jerusalem. But it's through that foolishness that we have been set free from sin. It's through that foolishness that we are saved. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1 at verse 18, the apostle Paul writes, if any, I, no, that's why I'm in chapter 3. I can't talk and I can't see. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. And so it says down in verse 31, so that as it is written, let the one who boast, boast in the Lord. You see, all through the Bible, a person who has the eyes of faith is willing to be a fool for God. And I want you to hear this. Walls are not brought down by our understanding. Walls are brought down by our obedience. I'm going to say that again because I think that's one of the most important things I'm going to say tonight. That walls are not brought down by our understanding of God's commands. Walls are brought down by our simple trusting obedience to His commands. You see, God's Word doesn't need to be understood as, it, as much as it needs to simply be undertaken in our lives. Because God delights in beating His enemies through foolishness. And people with the eyes of faith come to understand that we fight from victory and not for victory. And then finally, let me point this out to you from this story. That faith sees that sin's curse will one day be removed by the judgment of God. I mentioned this earlier, stories like Joshua and, and fighting and battle, they're offensive to many people today. 
And I think the reason why that is is because they only want to talk about God as, as love, a God of mercy, and a God of grace. And He is certainly all of those things. Scripture is clear that that's who He is. But a story like Joshua chapter 6 offends their sensibilities because it destroys kind of their own God, their own idol that they have built up in their mind. The people who want to criticize the wrath of God rarely notice His patience. Because you could go back in Genesis chapter 15. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give the people of the land that I'm promising you 400 years to fill up a cup of their sin. And so think about the patience of God. For 400 years, God was patient with Canaan, giving them opportunity to repent and turn back to Him. And then even when he came into their land, God was still willing to spare anyone who would turn to him. But understand this, God is willing to receive anyone who would turn and come to him. God will forgive anyone who seeks forgiveness. God will give grace to anyone who seeks his grace. But the same God of love, grace, and mercy is the same God who declared war against Satan and against sin. And I think when we look at this story of Jericho, it is a tangible illustration of God's intention to totally destroy the works of the devil, to totally defeat and to destroy him. I think there's a lot of people today just like the people in Jericho. All the people in Jericho, they had 40 years of news reports of breaking news coming across their screen, if you will, about what God was doing in Israel. They heard about Egypt. They heard about Og. They heard about Sihon. They, they saw what had happened with the Jordan River. They heard and they, about all of the things that God had done for Israel. And just like people today, they ignored the reports. They paid no attention to them. They thought that they were protected by their own creation. I'll tell you, a God who can part the sea, stop a river, and knock down walls is not intimidated by any man-made creation. He's not intimidated. And I don't know what gates that, that you and I have built up today. I don't know what empires we think that we have created that's going to protect us from the judgment of God. But all it takes is just one blast of the trumpet in one shout. And that wall that we thought was protecting us, it'll come down. Just think about all of, all of the cities that were destroyed. You think about Jericho or I was reading recently about Babylon. You, you, can, you can go just south of Baghdad in, in Iraq today, and there's the ruins of Babylon. That great nation, that great empire, now it's nothing but ruins. You see, throughout history, God has given evidence after evidence that the gates of hell will not stand against His purposes. And so, just as the destruction of the Canaanites was an announced fact, in the mind of God, God's judgment on Satan's army and on sin has already been decided. And there is no wall of man's creation that's going to stop God from doing what he intends to do in his war against Satan and against sin. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise as some men count slowness. But God is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse 9. And the text goes on to talk about the fact that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. I don't know when that day is going to be, but I do know that the armies of God are marching around this culture. And they're silent, just like God's told them to be. But when he gives the word, the trumpet is going to blow, the shout is going to come, and he's going to destroy all ungodliness. And so I hope that we'll allow tonight any walls that we have built up to be knocked down, to be destroyed, and to place our faith and our trust 
in God. Do you see faith as a victory that's already been decided? Do you see by faith that sin and Satan are going to be destroyed in this war? Do you see yourself numbered among the people of God? If you go back to chapter 2 and read the story of Rahab, Rahab by faith numbered herself with the people of God. She chose God. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. So let me close real quick by giving you this last principle. I believe that our Jerichos stand when we only walk by sight. As long as we walk by sight, Jericho stands. We all have places in our lives where Satan has tried to put up gates. It might be an addiction. It might be uh, your temper. It might be your struggle in your family. It might be your struggle to grow spiritually. And he says, I've shut you out. You can't get out. I've shut you out from the blessings of Christ. But I hope you see tonight from this story that the God of Israel, His power is sufficient for your Jericho if you can see it and obey. And right now at this moment, there could be someone here tonight who needs to trust and obey the commands of God. It seems foolish to the world that God would give the command, he that believes and is baptized, that is, he that believes and is immersed in water will be saved. To the eye of the flesh, it makes no sense. Why would I need to just be dunked in water? But that's a way that God shows through what we see as foolishness, his mighty plan to have our sins washed away in the waters of baptism by the blood of Jesus, and we can be victorious. If we can help you with your relationship with God tonight, let us know while we stand and sing.